hallelujah. Come alive in the name of Jesus. We are a house of miracles. Like I've said now a number of times, we're going to be on Instagram right away. Like I've said now a number of times, uh, that's not the name of our church, our ministry. <clears throat> Although I've thought about changing it and making it House of Miracles. But um, we, are, we are a house of miracles. And we see miracles every week, every service. We see God do miraculous things. And uh, we, we experienced another one this week uh, with the weather pattern uh, that went through here. They were predicting tornadoes and, and, and 100 mile an hour winds and I mean, you name it. And uh, I stood out there in front and spoke to the atmosphere, spoke to the weather, spoke to the wind, and I commanded in the name of Jesus, you're going to separate, you're going to go around, you're not coming through Tulsa, you're not coming through Broken Arrow and the surrounding communities because we're redeemed from that curse. And I take authority over you and I bind you up in the name of Jesus. And I said, ministering angels, go forth right now. Begin to separate that storm. Begin to move it out and around whatever you have to do so that that extreme weather does not come here. And it didn't, praise God. And I've got, I took pictures of it. I've got a, a map, um, a weather map. And uh, I, you could see the movement of the storm. Literally, it broke into two. One section went up north of us. and One section went down just, uh, you know, south of us. And then ended up going up kind of north um, east uh, away from us into Arkansas. And we never got that extreme weather. And, and we're not going to. We're, we're taking authority over it. So I'm declaring it in the name of Jesus. But the last few storms, ever since we moved here, we started taking authority over the storms and uh, commanding the, them to go out and around. And if there's any extreme weather, go out into the dry places or into the unpopulated places and uh, angels putting them on assignment to go out there and get that accomplished. And we've been watching uh, the hand of God. See, God gave Adam the dominion and authority over creation. And Adam lost it, of course, when he sinned, but Jesus got it back. And you know who he gave it to? He didn't give it to the organized church. He didn't give it to a denomination. He gave it to believers. That's the real church, the believers, the people who believe. And uh, we're now in, in our generation, we're finally coming to a place where we're beginning to understand what God's original plan and will is for mankind and just how much dominion and authority he's given us to bring us back to that place where Adam was before the fall. That's redemption, being redeemed to the way God originally intended it to be. So I'm not preaching that, but it's a good start tonight. Uh, it's, I'm Pastor Bill Emmons, in case you've tuned in for the first time tonight. And this is Covenant Faith Center, CFC Ministries International. And we're glad that you're with us. Now we know there's a whole lot of people that are viewing, whether we see your name or not. If you put something in a, if you're on Facebook, or on Instagram, because those are the two live feeds we currently have. Now we've got, besides them, we've got 13 other social media platforms that we put this out on, but the live ones are on Facebook and Instagram. And so, uh, you know, when we talk about live right now, that that's who's seeing it. But on Instagram and on, on Facebook, if you leave a comment, uh, we'll know you were here will know that you watch the program. And I'm going to encourage uh, everybody, uh, don't be one of these uh, fast food uh, junkies. And by that, I don't mean eating physical food. I'm talking about the way, and there's probably a term for it that I don't know. Uh, but the um, people that do the studies say that the average view on, uh, on social media is only about six minutes on average. Well, you can't get much done, much said in six minutes. You need to finally set a time aside some time to listen to what God is saying. And uh, God is speaking through me, through others. Uh, we're all over social media. There's some that are on television. Uh, and you, there's no excuse for you to 
one day stand before God and uh, find out that uh, you're not, and I hate to say it this way because it sounds uh, really bad, but when you choose not to receive the message, or you choose not to receive Jesus as Lord, and you want to live your life and basically worship uh, the flesh, uh, you've basically made a decision for uh, the only one of two choices that could be. Because the only way to get into heaven is to make Jesus Lord of your life and accept the sacrifice he made for you. The Bible says God loved you so much that he sent Jesus to pay the price for your sins. There's no other name under heaven by which men might be saved. It's Jesus. I'm sorry, it's not Buddha. It's not Confucius. It's not Joseph Smith. It's not Muhammad. It's not, and we can go on with uh, names of heads of religions, people that are even worshipped as gods. Uh, it's only through Jesus Christ. He is the only begotten Son. So if you're looking for some uh, religious, um, you know, thing to tickle your fancy. The Bible says in the end times, people are going to heap up to themselves uh, one teacher after another, chosen to appeal to their likes. Well, sometimes uh, the gospel truth, uh, what God has declared, is not always fun to hear. But ultimately, when you make Jesus Lord, it changes your life. And you become a new creation. And then things do get fun in the in the spiritual sense. Uh, I have I enjoy doing this, preaching and teaching the Word of God, ministering to people, more than anything else in in this natural world, because nothing else brings the joy like walking in the th in the presence of God. Amen. All right, so uh, we are an online church. I'm an online pastor. I, I've stood before a congregation for 45 years uh, behind a pulpit. And God began to move us uh, into expanding this aspect of our ministry, which we have uh, done and, and are continuing to do. Uh, so stick around. I'm sure if you'll stay, you'll hear something that will help you and that will bless you. Amen. All right. Uh, the message title, if you want to take notes, and I hope you do, uh, is Faith's Response. When, when you're attacked, when, and I don't, I don't mean by somebody, um, you know, attacking you, your character or something like that, although that is an attack of the devil. When, when you're under attack spiritually, mentally, physically, financially, socially, any kind of a, an attack that could hurt you or harm you in some way, uh, Jesus said that is the thief that comes to steal, kill, and destroy. That's all he does. The devil doesn't ever give you anything good. He never gives you anything but what he wants to use it to kill you and take you take away from you. Uh, Jesus said, but I came to give you life and that in abundance. So there is a clear dividing line. And when we talk about faith's response. I want to I want to kind of uh, bring it in to focus by talking about a few people in the Bible who were faced with big choices. And in, in these cases that we're going to look at, <clears throat> they were given clear directives by God, and they had, to, they had to respond to that. And when God begins to move in your life, and, and he'll speak to you, and he'll uh, impress upon you, do this, don't do that, go this way, don't go that way, go this other way. You know, he'll, he'll begin to direct your life by the Holy Spirit. But you have to make a choice that you're going to be led by the Spirit. The Bible says if we're led by the Spirit, the Spirit of God, that we won't be subject to the, the flesh itself. What The flesh, the sense realm, the natural realm that we live in won't have any control over us because we are spirit beings, even though we live in a natural body. But the natural body does not control us. We control it. Amen. So faith's response. How do you respond? Those of you that are believers... How do you respond when God calls you to do something that's beyond your current level of experience? Uh, like when God called me, uh, I had no idea I'd ever be a preacher. Uh, I had no interest in it. I was an architectural designer. I thought I was going to design big, beautiful churches for, for, for other uh, preachers and congregations and 
custom homes for people that had a lot of money. <laughs> you know, if you're going to be an architect, you might as well go big, right? And so I really thought that was the direction I was going to go. And it didn't take long for God to get a hold of me and totally change my direction in life. And uh, he called me into the ministry, which I, like I said, I never would have expected that. In fact, driving home from the meeting that I was at, it was actually a fellowship, and uh, driving home that night, I, I, you know, I have a heart that's willing to obey God. And, uh, and I said, you know, Father, I'm willing to do what you want me to do. If you call me into the ministry, I'm willing to do that and change my direction. Uh, but you need to talk to my wife about it. <laughs> So, because we need to walk in unity. A lot of pastors out there, a lot of preachers out there, your spouse may not be in agreement with what you're doing, but you kind of soldier through it, just kind of push your way through that door and make it happen. And you got an unhappy spouse or a spouse that's um, uncooperative, doesn't get in agreement with you, and you're living a, a really tough life because you made a choice that may have been actually contradictory to what God had for you. And uh, I, I know people say, well, but I heard from God. Well, sometimes when you hear from God, you gotta wait. You, you can't just jump into things. We don't believe in knee-jerk reactions. We believe in taking things. If we, we feel like we're hearing from God, we, we do a couple of things. One, we talk to people that have more experience, people we look up to and respect that understand what we're talking about and have been there. And uh, we look to them for counsel. The Bible says to do that. And then we spend time in prayer and in studying and meditating the Word of God to make sure we've got a scriptural basis for what we feel that God's speaking. And uh, as we pray in the Spirit, the Holy Spirit will begin then to direct your life and show you what steps to take. Uh, there's, there's time. I got... When I first started the ministry, I got a phone call from a gentleman who was high up in a, a particular denomination, and he knew me. And uh, once he found out that I was called to the ministry, he called me. And he said, uh, our denomination is prepared to offer you a big church in Orange County, California, a uh, big congregation. They have new buildings that they built and paid for. Uh, they're looking for a pastor. And we're willing to offer you uh, a good salary. And you come down to Orange County and you can find whatever house you choose and the church will pay for it. You and your wife can go out and buy new cars and the church will pay for those. And, you know, when you're young in the ministry, I was in my 20s, Pastor Mary and I both. And you think, wow, this has got to be God. I mean, you know, God has, has uh, called me into the ministry and here's it served to me on a platter. And so, but I, I was smart enough, even at that age, to just didn't, I didn't jump on it. I said, brother, I got to pray about this. I appreciate the offer. Let me pray about it and get back to you. And so I did, and, and God spoke to me so clearly. And he said, you can do that if you want. He said, but if you do that, you'll never fulfill what I've called you to do. Because I didn't call you to do that. And I, I sadly had to call that brother back and say, you know, I, again, I appreciate your offer and everything, but I prayed about it. And that's not what God told me. And they told me that if I did that, it, that I could, but if I did, I'd never fulfill the calling he had on my life. And, uh, you know, so you got You can't just jump on things just because you feel like you got a word from the Lord or somebody prophesied over you, uh, which happens a lot. People get prophesied over and they, they jump and run and do things that God didn't tell them to do. Not everybody that gives a word is, is either uh, hearing from God all the time, or they give you a word and they don't follow it up with, maybe they didn't get the whole word or whatever about timing. You know, sometimes God will speak to you about something that's down the road and you've got to find that out. The main point I want to get at here tonight is when you know, that God has spoken. How do you respond? Because your response will ultimately determine uh, success or failure in that endeavor. If you respond in faith, 
then you can be guaranteed that God's going to move with you. The Bible says the steps of a righteous man are order of the Lord. So God's going to move with you in his perfect will and bless you and prosper you, spirit, soul, and body, so that you can accomplish and you can succeed in what he's given you to do. But if you respond in unbelief, or if you respond in fear, you know, I, I've, I could have said, you know, I, I have no idea. I, I never wanted to be a pastor, never wanted to be a preacher. And I don't know if this is God. And, you know, I could reject that word. But I got to tell you, in my, my personal experience, when God spoke to me, it, it was so clear. And God knew. <laughs> he's, he's pretty smart. He knew what I needed in order to believe uh, what he was saying was, was him. <clears throat> and he spoke to me in an audible voice. I was at a meeting with some preachers uh, at an Assembly of God church. Actually, it was a fellowship meeting after a long seminar, a uh, 10-day seminar. And there were some preachers there that uh, some of you might know. Uh, Kenneth and Gloria Copeland were there. Um, the pastor of that church, uh, Hallie, uh, Her 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 Herbie Zell, I think it was, was his first name. Uh, uh, Ed Dufresne was there. Dennis Burke was there. Michael Landsman was there. Now, these are people that all have, uh, have you know, have full-time ministers uh, that God called them. Uh, so I was, you know, in good company. And that night, God began to move. And all this, and I'm standing up against the wall watching God move and minister to all these people that were there. And all of a sudden, I heard an audible voice. And I, I turned to look because I thought somebody was standing next to me talking to me. And there was nobody around me. And God uh, spoke to me and said, what you're seeing tonight in this ministry, you're going to see in your own ministry if you will follow me into the ministry. I couldn't shake that. That, that was clearly an audible vo voice of God. And uh, I, again, I prayed on the way home, God, you got to speak, you know, speak to my wife. Uh, you're going to have to make it happen because I have no idea how to make it happen. The same thing happened when he called me to pastor. That was calling me to teach and preach. And then when he called me to pastor, that was the last thing I wanted to do. But again, driving home from the first meeting that became our church, uh, God spoke to me and said, that's not a home Bible study. It's a new church and you're the pastor. And I thought, in my mind, I thought, no way. But I, from my heart, I said, Father, again, I'll do whatever you want me to do. But there's people involved in this and you got to confirm it with them as well. And boy, I'll tell you what, God didn't waste any time. And I've been in the, I've been in the ministry for, well, this year marks 50 years and pastoring uh, where from 1977, uh, what are we, 40, 44 years? I don't know. I'm trying to do the numbers off the top of my head. It's been a while. 45 years, 46, I think we're in the 46th year. Anyway, so... When God speaks, your response will have a direct impact on the outcome. All right, now let's look at some examples. Uh, if we're going to be successful in what we believe God's called us to do, then we're going to have to make a choice on how to respond. And that choice will be either uh, faith and trust or doubt and unbelief, uh, where you're not trusting God. So I want to look at some examples tonight. We're going to read some scriptures. We might not get through because there's a lot of scripture. But remember, this is a Bible study. We're not, I'm just not preaching a sermon. Uh, we're actually studying the Word of God and learning tremendous biblical principles from it. So with the time we've got left, about 40 minutes roughly, we're going to go through and read scripture and talk about it. Uh, I want to go back to uh, a group of people we've talked about for the last, I think, three weeks in a row. Uh, and this is Israel. When God called Israel and brought them out of Egyptian bondage and was heading, bringing them toward the promised land, there were things he said about the promised land. There was things he said about entering the promised land. 
Israel had to make a choice to trust God that what God was saying was true, that, that it wasn't an empty promise. I mean, God doesn't lie, but, you know, are we sure that's God? You know, because God was speaking through Moses and Aaron. And uh, so, you know, is that really God? People do that with their pastors a lot. Oh, I don't know. I think that's just the pastor. I don't think God's speaking through him. And churches get in trouble because they don't trust God that the man standing behind that pulpit was appointed by God and anointed to do that job of shepherding that congregation. And they get into trouble. So here we have in Numbers, uh, Numbers 33, starting at verse 50. I'm going to read this from the King James translation. The Lord spake unto Moses in the plains of Moab by Jordan, near Jericho, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When you are passed over Jordan into the land of Canaan, then you shall drive out all the inhabitants of the land from before you, and destroy all their pictures, and destroy all their molten, um, yeah, molten images, and um, quite pluck down all their high places. I just lost my reading light here, so I'm having to shift my notes around. Verse uh, 53, And ye shall dispossess the inhabitants of the land and dwell therein, for I have given you the land to possess it. Now you have to remember that uh, when God spoke originally and made that promise to Israel, of that land, there were no inhabitants in that land. Uh, and this goes way back before Moses. And uh, God spoke to Abraham uh, and promised that land. And all the inhabitants that were there were people that were there illegally because they had all heard the reports that God spoke through prophets to Israel about that land. And so you have a lot of uh, different tribes living on the land that actually belonged to Israel. But there would come a day when Israel would have to possess the land. That's what he's talking about. He says, I have given you the land to possess it. Now, what does that mean? See, I have means past tense. So God says, I have given you the land. If God has given it to them, then there's really not a whole lot for them to do except possess the land. And that's what God is speaking to them to do here, possess the land. And in the process, you're going to dispossess the enemies that are there, the people that hate you, want to destroy you. And, but God had made a promise that if they'll do that, he'll go before them and he'll drive their enemies from the land. And then he gives them some instructions about pulling down the high places and, uh, you know, where they worship false gods and false idols and so forth. Uh, our idols made by hand. And then verse 54, and you shall divide the land by lot for an inheritance among your families. And to the more you shall give the more inheritance and to the fewer you shall give the less inheritance. Every man's inheritance shall be in the place where his lot falleth. According to the tribes of your fathers, you shall inherit. But if ye will, now listen, if you will not drive out the inhabitants of the land before you, then it shall come to pass that those which you let remain of them shall be pricks in your eyes and thorns in your side, and you shall, they shall vex you in the land wherein you dwell. Now, let me stop there and make a comment. <clears throat> Israel has yet to totally possess the land. Their land, what God promised them, was from uh, the Nile River all the way to the Euphrates River. And it was um, all the way to the Mediterranean. And when I read it, uh, and, you know, it's not hard to figure out. You look at a map and you see where God says, and you got that whole, uh, uh, well, I guess you have uh, Saudi Arabia there now. Uh, that whole big old peninsula that, that they're on, along with some other countries. All of that, God said he was giving to Israel. So that whole land. And their job was to turn that land into a garden, to bring 
back what Adam lost, to bring back the garden condition and do what God told Adam to do, which is to possess the land, to multiply, and to have dominion and authority uh, over not just the land, but over everything else that God made. That was their job, and they didn't do it, and they still haven't done it. Now, I'm not talking against Israel. What I'm saying is they've still got some possessing and dispossessing to do in order for God to get involved with that. They have to take a step of faith. All right, so the next verse says, Moreover, it shall come to pass that I, that I shall, and I had to go in and, and go back. The, the English translations uh, have not really clarified what God said there. And there's those places in the Old Testament where God talks about doing things to Israel when the reality is there's a causative permissive verb in that uh, Hebrew language in the Old Testament. And it basically says God will be caused to allow. So here, if we want to read this correctly, uh, well, let, first let me read it the way it's written in the English. Moreover, it shall come to pass that I shall do unto you as I thought to do unto them. But literally what it says is, I will have to allow to be done unto you what would be done unto their enemies. That's all different perspective. We talked about perception the uh, last few weeks. We've got to get the right perception, the right perspective on things by understanding the nature of God. God is not judging us today. God is not killing, stealing, and destroying people today. God is not our problem. God does not cause the earthquakes like we've seen in Turkey and in, um, uh, K see, what did I say it was? K Kyrgyzstan or, K K I, can't, I can't pronounce it. <laughs> um, uh, and then there was another one uh, uh, just a few days ago, another big one. I don't recall now where it was, but it was a good sized one. And, uh, but God's not doing that. He's not killing those people. That's the devil. Remember Jesus' words. The thief comes only in order to kill, to steal, and to destroy. That's his nature. Mm -hmm. So if, if there's stealing, killing, destroying going on, you can know that is not God. That is not the nature of God. God's nature is life. It's blessing. It's abundance. It's deliverance. It's provision. It's peace. All the good things that the Bible talks about. That's the nature of God. All right. So when, and I, I'm not going to go ahead and read all the other verses. We read them in the last three weeks, but let me just refer to them. When it came time for Israel to cross the Jordan River and go into the promised land there at Jericho, uh, the first thing Moses decided was, and God had told him to do this, send, send some men into the land to Scout it. Now we see it translated spies. And I guess in a sense, they were spying out the land. Excuse me while I take a sip of my tea. Awkward silence. <laughs> and so they chose 12 men, one from each tribe, leaders of those tribes. And they were given directions to go in the land, check it out. Find out where things are, where different tribes are, what's going on there, and uh, bring back a report. Let us know what we're what we've got to deal with, so we know how to approach it. And uh, so they went into the land for forty days, and they they came back, and uh, there was grapes. That the, I've showed this picture before, and I uh, got it sitting right here. Uh, they showed bunches of grapes. Now that. If you can see that, look at the people below that. Um, let me pick it up here. The people, you can see them standing below that. That's bigger than the height of a man. That is a bunch of grapes. <laughs> well, the, the, now something that big, one man couldn't carry that. And the Bible says that the bunches of grapes were so big that it took two men carrying them on a pole. That's kind of like that. And so... They come back and they say, you know, here's the land is everything God said it was. Now, first of all, they admit God was right. It was everything he said, a land flowing with milk and honey. 
It's got houses. It's got wells. It's got, you know, uh, fields, pastures. It's got everything that they would need. And so they, they first start off with the good part of the report, but they got over into some fear. They get over into unbelief really quick because after they said all the good stuff, they said, but, <laughs> and you know, when somebody starts off with good stuff and they say, but it's like kids in school, you know, um, you go, I remember when I was in school, I got called before the teacher or the principal. They, a lot of times they would start off with the good stuff. Well, you know, we, um, you, you've done this and you've done that and you've done a good job, but, <laughs> you know, I played football. Uh, the coach, you know, my coaches, they did the same thing. They would compliment us on the things we did right, but you need to do this. <laughs> You didn't do that. You didn't listen. You didn't, you know. And uh, so the moment you see, but, you know something negative is about to happen. And they say, but, uh, <laughs> the land swallows its inhabitants. Well, there's no, there's no evidence of that at all anywhere. They were exaggerating to try and prove their point. They did not want to go in and take that land because there were giants in the land. Literally, there were giants. The Nephilim the offspring of the, uh, the union between fallen angels and human women. And the Bible talks about that. You go back in Genesis chapter 6, read about it. That's why the flood of Noah had to happen, was to destroy the hybrid race that had developed. And I won't get into that tonight, but at least I'll give you a little teaser there. So they said that the sons of Anak are there. Anak and his tribe was a tribe of giants. And then there were the Hittites, and, the, and they name a bunch of other tribes, and war, warrior tribes, fighting tribes. And, um, you know, they hadn't fought anybody since they left Egypt. They're just living in, out there in the wilderness trying to survive, you know. And uh, now they're going to have to face these tribes. But God had promised to drive them out before them. If they will simply go in, and he used the word dispossess, in other words, take possession so they have to leave the land because it's not their land, Israel. It's your land. So they give the report and they say, but we cannot take the land. And then Joshua and Caleb both, they spoke up and uh, they said, yes, the land's everything God said it was. God has given us the land. We are well able to take the land. So let's go up at once and do it. Two guys gave a good report. Two guys had a faith response, a trust response. They believed in God and they trusted what God said. And they were willing to act on that in faith. The 10 spies didn't trust God. They didn't necessarily believe that what God said would be true. And so then they give this report in front of however many millions of Jews there were, or Israelites. And uh, the Bible says that the whole congregation uh, began to cry at this evil report, the Bible says, calls it that. And they cried all night long. That, that's some kind of crying. They cry all night long. Uh, I don't know anybody that's ever done that, but they did. And they began to murmur against Moses and against Aaron. And why did you bring us up? into this evil place and, and want to destroy us uh, by these giants. It would have been better to stay in Egypt as slaves. It would have been better to die in the wilderness of starvation. See, that was their choices. They could disobey God, die in the wilderness, or disobey God, go back to Egypt and be slaves again. Or they could take the promised land and be free finally after 400 years. Well, they murmured, they cried, and they actually decided to take a vote and they were going to elect a captain to take them back to Egypt. And uh, yeah, God spoke up. God, God, you know, finally had had enough and he spoke up. And, you know, we read the English again. I, I mentioned this causative permissive verb. And in the English uh, translations, uh, God says, uh, I'm going to do this. And he begins to describe what's going to happen to them. You're not going to go into the promised land. You're going to die in the wilderness and you're going to have this and that. And, you know, 
again, with the correct translation of that verb, God said, what I, what, what you're speaking in my ears, I hear and will be caused that to, I will be caused to allow that to happen to you. So you will die in the wilderness. You've chosen that. You, your sons and your daughters, many of them are going to die in the wilderness and they won't inherit the promised land because the, the Bible says everybody from the age of 20 on up would die then. And so they set the boundaries. They set the parameters of what was going to happen. And sure enough, over in the next 40, 45 years, everybody that was 20 years old and on up died. And it was the uh, next generation that followed Joshua and Caleb and believed what they said and stood with them that uh, they made it into the promised land. And when it came time to finally enter, Joshua and Caleb both again stood in front of Israel. Of course, Moses and Aaron had died by this time. And now after Moses dies, Joshua has taken over this, what had proven to be a bunch of stiff-necked Jews. And, and uh, he declares what God said. He rehearses it in their hearing. And he said, let's go up at once and take it. We can do this because God's given us the land. And they learned their lesson. Now the children or grandchildren uh, are the ones that are going to get to inherit the land. And they finally do. And they got cross over into, uh, you know, across the Jordan. And they, uh, we know the story of Jericho, the walls, <clears throat> the walls of defense that protected the citizens. Excuse me. <coughs> mm. That protected the citizens of Jericho uh, as they obeyed God. Uh, God told them to put the praisers and the trumpeters, the musicians, out in front. And they told them to march around the city. They crossed over Jordan. Now they're in the promised land. The first major obstacle was Jericho. So God said, put the praisers, the musicians, the worshipers out in front. And I want you to march around seven times, seven days. On the seventh day, I want you to march around seven times. And on the seventh time, I want you to shout. I want you to blow the trumpets. Let the worshipers go. Let them lift their voices. And the whole nation of Israel, which they were surrounding the city now, uh, on the seventh day did exactly. Nobody murmured. Why? Because they remembered their parents and grandparents. They didn't want to be sent back to die in the wilderness. So they were obedient. And they, they got everybody in unison and agreement and the walls the the Bible tells us and archaeologists now have proven this and verified it, that the walls didn't fall down. The walls just sunk into the ground and they went up right straight before them. Like the walls were on elevators and they just sunk down and Israel walked right in and took the, took the city. And other cities and even tribes heard what God was doing with Israel, and they began to flee before them. There were some that chose to stand and fight, but they lost. Uh, why? Because God was going before them and preparing their way. Because they finally had a faith response, and it produced victory. Those that had the response of fear, unbelief, distrust, didn't get to enjoy the promises. So the choices we have when we're confronted with uh, opportunity, whether it's good or bad, we have to, first of all, have a faith response. We got to believe what God promises us. The second thing is we've got to trust God that he will not lie to us. If we'll do what he says in his word, he will do what he promised. And then the third thing, there's got to be corresponding actions. We got to be willing to get up and put our faith uh, into motion. And, uh, of course we know the Bible tells us in the new Testament faith without words or corresponding actions is dead. Now, if you've been listening to me week after week after week, now you, you've heard that a lot. Why we're living in a time when we are confronted with evil. We're confronted with things that God has spoken to us 
and things the devil is trying to intimidate us with. And we have to make a choice. And we have to stand in faith and trust God. He's not going to let this nation be torn down and, and disrupted and, and dissolved and become slaves of some global cabal. God's not going to let that happen. Why? Because there are prayers and believers in this country, and we're going to continue to pray and watch God. And we see it happening right before us. It's happening daily. Things are changing. People that have been the, the ones that are trying to destroy this nation are being removed. They're being brought down. And God's raising up people that will obey what he says to do. Amen. All right. Let me see. How are we on time? Ooh, we got about a little over 10 minutes left. 20 minutes. A little over 10 minutes would be maybe 20 minutes, <laughs> 15 minutes, 20 minutes. All right. Um, Abraham was faced with a, a really difficult decision. God spoke to Abraham. Again, we're not going to read it. We've read this in the past month or two in the teaching we've done. Uh, Abraham, God spoke to him and he said, take your son, your only son. Now, by the time Isaac was born, Abraham already had one son. His name was Ishmael. The problem was he, had a, he was from a polluted bloodline. By that, I mean they were not a godly bloodline. And uh, they were from another tribe, another uh, group of people. They were not the children of Israel. And uh, it was through uh, Sarah's handmaid uh, that uh, Abraham uh, bore his first son, and uh, that was Ishmael. And the Bible says that because of that, he'll all, the, his descendants will always be a thorn in your side. Today, they're surrounded by the Ishmaelites and they are a thorn in the side of Israel. It's time for Israel to drive out the inhabitants. Amen. Now, I'm not the president of Israel, the prime minister, anything like that, but I know what they need to do. And the, of course, the world will frown on that if they were to do that. But that's where trusting God comes in. Because God said, I'll drive out the inhabitants if you'll go before me. Or if you'll go into the land. All right. So, Abraham, God spoke to him and said, take your son, your only son. Take him up on the place on the mountain where I'm going to show you. And sacrifice him unto me. Now, you know, you get a, you get a statement like that where God tells you to sacrifice your child. Let me, let me warn you right now. God is not asking anybody in this earth to sacrifice their child to him. The purpose of that, God had to have a man, a covenant man, that was willing to be totally obedient to God to the point of giving his best, his son. And that opened the door for God then to give his best, Jesus. That's all part of covenant. So God wasn't going to kill Isaac, but there had to be a sacrifice in some fashion that could open that door for God to send Jesus. And so uh, when he gets to the bottom of the mountain, he, he sees the mountain where God was telling him to go. He's got all the stuff, the paraphernalia to build an altar. And, uh, you know, he's going to go up there and gather stones and build a, uh, an altar. Then he's going to pile firewood on top of it. He's even carried the fire with him. And uh, Isaac is with him. He's about 14 years old at this point. And he, Abraham tells the servants that were handling the camels or whatever it was they were uh, riding on or had carrying their, their stuff. He said, uh, you guys stay here and take care of the stuff. I and the boy shall return. It's a little tiny statement but it was a statement of faith. It was a statement of trust. He trusted God. He put his trust in God. If, if God is ever going to fail me, this seems like this would be the place, if that's possible. But I believe God that if necessary, if I've got to kill my son and burn him to ashes, that I have so much faith in God's covenant promises to me that he will raise my son up out of the ashes if necessary. That's a strong commitment of faith and trust. And then there were the corresponding actions where I actually took the steps to do that. And so he takes the son and they walk up the mountain and 
they get to the place where God told them to build the altar and together they're working, father and son, they're building the altar and they're placing the wood around the altar. And finally, his 14 year old son, Isaac speaks up and he says, um, uh, dad, I got a question for you. Abraham says, what? And he says, um, I see the altar and I see the wood and I see the fire, but where's the sacrifice? Abraham's statement has been missed by a lot of people. He said, God will provide himself a sacrifice. Well, now today we can look back and understand the symbology that's used there. First of all, God is giving of himself by sending his only begotten son, Jesus. So literally God is giving himself. He's sacrificing his heart for the heart of all mankind by sending Jesus. And then after he tells Isaac that, they hear a rustling in the, in the shrubbery and they look over and there's a ram caught in the thicket. And so he goes over, he gets the ram, and he's, he's, I'm sure he's really happy, you know, at this point. But he was trusting God the whole time. He just didn't know how far it would go. And he takes the ram, and they put it up on the altar and tie it down. They slit its throat, and they bleed it out, and, and they, then they burn that animal as a sacrifice. That's part of covenant. Those, that's a covenant ceremony. That means God and Abraham are bound together from that point. And God cannot break his promises. So after it's all said and done, him and Isaac walk on down the mountain. They come back to the servants that are handling the goods and the animals. And they get their stuff together and they head back home. He had a choice to make. Was he going to believe that God would do what he said? See, if he, if he killed his son and God didn't keep his promise, then God's a liar. God promised that through Isaac, not through Ishmael, but through Isaac, Abraham's descendants would be, and that they would outnumber, you know, the tribes of the earth. They would be the biggest tribe. They would uh, be as the sands of the sea and as the stars of the sky without number. And the whole earth would be blessed by them. That could only happen if Isaac didn't die. Or if he died and was raised from the dead. Well, the Bible says that in a figure or symbolically, Abraham, as far as he was concerned, Isaac was as good as sacrificed, but he was trusting God. And so God accepted that act of faith. And it, it's the it, faith of Abraham that we follow, where we trust God. So he had, he had first of all, he cho choose, he chose, got that? He chose, he chose to believe God. He chose to trust God. And then he chose to act on what God said. So these are the decisions you have to make when you're confronted with, and it's not just when God confronts you with uh, an assignment or something. Even when the devil confronts you and he promises great things or he threatens you and tells you he's going to kill you or he's going to do this or he's going to do that. You have to make a choice not to believe what the devil is saying because he's a liar. There's a lot of things he's told me. And I, I have to open my mouth and say, devil, you're a liar and the truth's not in you. I reject that. You've got to reject the things the devil tells you. Well, how do you know when it's the devil talking to you? If it's lying, if it's stealing, if it's destruction, killing, stealing, destroying, see? If it ends in those things... It's not God. It is the devil. If it's something that you can't put a scripture to and you can't verify two or three times in the Bible that what you're hearing actually is something God has done in the past. The Bible says there's nothing new under the sun. So whatever God might tell you to do, there has to be biblical proof that God's done that before. And a lot of times we don't do that. That's where that knee-jerk reaction comes in. We get a, a message, a word, an impression. We think it's God. We jump and do something. It's like some woman who, uh, you know, was praying one day, and she looked over and saw this handsome-looking guy in the congregation, and she says, God just told me I'm going to marry you. And that guy says, see, you got to be kidding me. We're not going that way. Well, she wanted to bring something that wasn't God, make herself look foolish, embarrass the guy, cause the church to look foolish because the devil wants to do that all the time instead of waiting 
Instead of seeking God, seeking the Holy Spirit, seeking the word and getting the wisdom of God, getting it confirmed, not necessarily by somebody giving you a, a word of a prophecy or something, but by getting it by the Holy Spirit. And sometimes God will use people to give you a word. But something like that, you got to learn to put things on the shelf and leave them there until you, uh, you have it confirmed definitely in your heart that that's God. All right. Well, how are we on time? We're just about, well, we got about 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, all right. Let me see where we are. We are to the story of Zacharias, Zacharias, however you want to pronounce it, and John the Baptist, or he's John the Baptist's father. And I'm not, I'm not going to read this to you because it's long. Maybe we can do that next week uh, to kind of backtrack and bring you up to date. But the short of it is that when Zechariah or Zacharias, I've seen it in the Bible both ways, his wife was Elizabeth. God speaks to him and, and says, now they're up in age. They're, they're old enough where physically it's like Abraham and Sarah. Physically, they could not bear children anymore. And so this angel comes to him and said, I've been sent from God to tell you that you're going to, you're going to, your wife's going to get pregnant and you're going to have a son. You're going to call his name John. And he's going to be a forerunner. He's going to go before uh, the, the uh, uh, Messiah, the Redeemer that's going to come, that God promised. He tells them all these things. We'll read it next week. And then it, at the end of all that, Zechariah, uh, he questions. He doubts. I don't, I don't believe this. You know, it's kind of, you know, I don't think this is God. I don't think you're an angel of God. I think you're a demon or I, I, this is not possible. I'm too old. My wife's too old. It's Mary, on the other hand, had a very similar experience where an angel appeared to her and said she's going to get pregnant and bear a child. And the only question she had was not a challenging question uh, where I don't believe. It was, well, how, how can this happen? Because I'm not married yet. I don't know. A man. I've never had sex with a man, you know. And the angel explained how it was going to happen. She wasn't questioning whether or not it would happen, where Zachariah did. She's questioning, how, how can this happen? How can this be? And it, there's a difference between challenging the validity and questioning the, the, the methodology, if you want to say it that way. What, how is this going to happen? There's a lot of things God's spoken to me, and I've sat there and thought, Lord, how, how is this going to come to pass? How are you going to do this? I'm not questioning whether or not God's going to do it. I'm, I'm asking, what do I need to know here? What, what is it that, that maybe I'm not seeing? And sometimes God says, you don't need to know. Just let me handle this. And God will begin to set things in motion. Then I'll see, okay, then the Holy Spirit can begin to lead me in that direction. All right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close it down with that. We'll pick this up. We're going to read the verses next week. And we're going to compare the responses of Zechariah and Elizabeth uh, to Mary and Joseph and see what happened and see, uh, you know, how the angels responded who brought the message. By the way, angels are messengers and they can bring a message from God. Uh, they're ministering spirits sent forth to minister to and for the heirs of salvation. And that's us, born-again Christians. So uh, let me just share quickly with you. Uh, if Our email address is w-e-m-m-o-n-s-0-1 at gmail.com. Uh, if you want to send us a comment, if you want to um, share with us a testimony, or if you have a prayer request, by all means, send us a prayer request. And my, Pastor Mary and I, uh, we will pray. And uh, we've got partners, and partners are praying for this ministry and praying for us as we pray for them on a daily basis. And um, when we have a faith project, our, our partners are ones that get involved with that faith project and believe with us, use their faith and add it to ours uh, for, for the vision, the goals, whatever God gives us to do, getting them accomplished. Amen. Uh, but the, our partners also support this ministry. And so I, I say all that to let you know that 
Uh, this ministry is 100% supported by the giving of the viewers, which includes you. Uh, the bulk of what comes in is from our partners, but there are those that uh, will give from time to time. And all I'm going to ask you to do is pray. If this ministry is blessing you, if we're encouraging you, giving you something to, to you know, stand on, um, pray about being a partner, pray about supporting what we're doing. And uh, I'm going to put a screen up in front of me here, these last uh, couple minutes here. And this screen is going to tell you the methods by which you can give, if that's what you feel impressed to do. And I know God's speaking to people to do that. If we've got some things God's called us to do, it's going to take some of that kind of help to get it done. Uh, if you want to mail uh, a tithe or an offering into this ministry, make it out to CFC. On the screen there, you see our post office box 141074, Broken Arrow, Oklahoma, 74014. Then the next line, line three, PayPal, that's the PP, stands for PayPal. If you have a PayPal account, you can go in there and type in our email address, which is seen there on line three. And uh, then make sure it, once you do that, when you get to the page, it gives you the option of uh, clicking friends and family. Make sure you do that. Uh, otherwise, they'll take out fees. Um, and then you just follow through with, you know, the process there. If you have a Venmo account, you can go to Venmo and type in what you see on the screen, the at symbol, and then it's William-Emmons-10. Capitalize the first letter of both names and you got it. If you want to give by debit or credit card, you have two ways you can do that or a combination of the two. You can send us your card information by email or you can text it to us at that number on the bottom of the screen, 818-679-7067. And we will run that card. Once it's approved, we will delete your information. Nobody will ever get their hands on it. We're very protective of our partners and our givers, our supporters' uh, in personal information. We don't give it to anybody. Uh, I have had people that have given in this ministry on a regular basis in the past, and they want to use credit cards for the points and stuff. So they would give half of the information on <clears throat> our email, and then they would give the other half of the information on the text. And then we would just combine the information for the whole thing. All right, pray about it. Sunday morning, we'll be here ministering. Once again, our Sunday morning service was morning for some people. Um, anyway, uh, in our Sunday service, we worship. We have a time of worship at the beginning, just like regular church service. I make some announcements. Instagram family, we love you guys. We'll see you uh, Sunday. Well, maybe Thursday. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, we, treat, we treat it just like a regular service because we are a church. We're online right now. And uh, we make our announcements, let people know what's going on. And uh, then we minister. And then as the Holy Spirit directs, we pray for the sick. If the Holy Spirit wants to manifest uh, the gifts of the Spirit or anything else, signs, wonders, and miracles, we believe in all that. And, and we've had some great services. So join us and don't come to judge and criticize. Come to receive and you will be blessed. Amen. All right. So with that, I'm going to say good night. Have a blessed week. And Thursday, we'll be giving you a short uh, exhortation. I don't know what time, but you'll be notified. Click the notification button. Click the follow button. If you, uh, I appreciate if you go to our page on uh, YouTube under Pastor William Emmons and uh, subscribe and share and click. You always share. Always. We're, on, we're at almost 25,000 as of today for this week, views. And so we're, we're believing God to get over that and continue to grow. All right, I got to stop. <laughs> That's it. Be blessed.